It's difficult a little bit to tell what are what are his areas of interest, okay? Because he may have interests in any subject connected to the area. Uh, the question is not uh, what is the area, but what are the kind of problem. Uh, he mainly like those problems that uh, that are hard and that will stay a uh, long time. Uh, uh, he's a he's a he's an editorial board of many journals. And uh, it seems for me, I, I had the opportunity to to be close <coughs> one in a while, that before he accepted being in the editorial board, uh, he first read all the previous uh, numbers, okay, and all the previous love volumes to do, if, uh, if he's able to do that. So he knows everything, he has read nearly everything, uh, and he remembers half of it. Uh, uh, very generous person. Uh, with uh, very strong, uh, uh, very strong uh, theoretical, uh, strong theoretical approach to the kind of service we treat here. Uh, he used to have a warning for PhD candidates in his homepage. I, I got in their homepage yesterday and realized it's not there anymore. Probably they are telling each other automatically. So. Uh, Thanks, Marcel. I don't know. I don't know where I got all these ideas about editorial boards and journals and all that. That's uh, yeah. Well, never mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. And uh, this talk is about, it, it, I, I called it memory and storage applications and I will really begin with storage and uh, this is, it turns out to be uh, an algebraic coding theory talk and as Rudiger said yesterday, algebraic coding is in the 1960s and yeah, so I feel a little bit like that, but I, I hope to, I hope to convince you that uh, there are some new ideas that are to be found even in those old, old, old old methods, old approaches, and so, and also you will see that, in fact, you already, we already saw this morning that distributed storage is of interest in, in many places in the world. In fact, three of the four student presentations were devoted in this or that way to, to distributed storage, and I'm going to speak about that uh, certainly all of today and maybe even most of, of the next or the third presentation. So, one of the hot topics mentioned yesterday in the panel is this big data. And in a naive sense, it, it, this big data applies to many, many areas, starting from statistics and, and data processing, data algorithms, but also information theory and, and coding. And naively, big data is simply about large volumes of data. And big players, of course, in this, uh, in this area are companies that uh, aggregate data for uh, their users, such as Facebook, such as Instagram, that was acquired by someone but still exists on its own, Google, Microsoft with its Azure storage. And then there are companies that, whose business is around providing distributed storage to, to individual and business customers, such as Dropbox, such as Box, such as a number of other similar companies. Uh, there are companies, therefore, that look at coding applications for distributed storage, one of them rather well known is Cleversafe. And if you look at their web page, you will see that what they are installing in the, is read solemn codes. And uh, I will mention more details about that, not about their solution, but about read solemn codes, hope, hoping to convince you that read solemn codes are not optimal in this application. And then we will discuss how they can be modified or replaced for better use in distributed storage. And then there are other companies um, doing similar things. So many talks in distributed storage start with this picture, and mine is no exception. Uh, this is, well, I got this from, from my postdoc, Zach Tamo, who recently moved to Tel Aviv, but he spent two years in Maryland, and uh, when Marcel was visiting all here, they also, he also got to know Zach. And so this apparently is what what a data center looks like uh, and this is taken from server at yahoo so as you see um, 
there are multiple drives, uh, and to, just to get the scale of the of the data, Facebook runs a Hadoop cluster of the order hundred peta petabytes. So it's you know megabytes and gigas and teras and pet is the next one, and one hundred of those is something like ten to the twenty bytes. And of course, you need a large number of drives, hard drives to store that, and you cannot have this in all location because of energy consumption, because of the heat that the, the drives produce. And I recently read somewhere that 3% of all electricity in the world is used in data centers. That doesn't sound right to me, but I still remember it from last week. I read it someplace. I don't know if that's true, but it's a large, large amount of energy that they consume. So they have to spread it around multiple physical locations. And of course, no wonder that in this environment, node failures are not an exception. They are a norm, even low probability of one drive, but a large volume then you know the, the low large numbers tells us that failures will occur. And so in this picture those exploded hot dogs really depict fail, failing drive, failing hard drives. Now to argue about failures, here is another st a statistic collected by Yahoo uh, in one calendar month uh, two or three years ago. And as you see, so this is the number of drives that are either permanently or temporarily inaccessible within one, one day. And one node is uh, 15 terabytes, so on average it's 20 per day, so it's 300 terabytes of data that cannot be accessed. And therefore repair becomes an actual problem for, for this business. It's, uh, repair cost becomes high, and so something, they need something. They, they need some, some type of coding solution to remedy for that. Uh, So there are two approaches uh, in the repair, to the repair problem. One is code with locality, and I will devote most of my talk to those. And the other one is regenerating codes, also briefly mentioned this morning. So let me spend one page, one slide on these regenerating codes, just to, to, to say what they are and what kind of problems one might expect to see there. And then we will move to locality. Uh, in the regenerating problem, a block of uh, data symbols, and they are assumed to be over some fixed size, fixed size finite field. So B symbols are encoded into N alpha symbols over the same alphabet. They are stored in N nodes, and uh, so alpha symbols per node. And the functionality is as follows. First, a data collector must be able to access any k nodes, so he gets alpha symbols, k times alpha symbols, and from those k alpha symbols, uh, it should be possible, never mind which nodes, it should be possible to recover the data. So it's an MDS-like property. But then if a drive fails, then it should be possible to repair the drive, and the repair problem, uh, so we need to recreate the contents of, of the failed drive in this node one prime, and Mm. It should be possible to do this by accessing uh, D, D nodes uh, and reading beta symbols from each of those D nodes. Beta is less than alpha. And there are two types of repair. One is exact repair, so we replicate at this node the contents of that node. And the other one is functional repair, where maybe there is, it is not an exact copy, but functionally the collection problem can still work. Never mind that it's not an exact copy of the data. So the uh, repair bandwidth is the amount of data read in the course of the repair procedure. So it's D nodes times beta. And then people study the trade-off between the storage per node, which is alpha, and the repair bandwidth. And this is a bound, one of the first results in the literature. And from there, people start studying regenerating codes. And, um, the approach is somewhat similar to network coding, and the methods are also somewhat similar. And there is a large number of works, all started with the paper by Alex DeMakis and, and co-authors from Berkeley in 2010. Uh, so the other approach is codes with locality, and then uh, let me move to those, because that's the main contents of my talk. So we focus on locally recover recoverable codes to be defined in a short while, uh, but Informally, we need, this is a block encoding, and what we need to do is this. 
uh, we have the code word and uh, let's say one symbol is missing. So in coding terminology, that's simply an erased coordinate, an erased position. We should be able to recover that erasure by accessing a small number of the other coordinates of the code word, R, R symbols. So this R is the locality parameter, and that will be will go through the entirety of my talk. So let's remember this R, uh, the number of positions that we need to read to recover another uh, a failed coordinate. And this is this is the plan, uh, rather ambitious. And I'll start with current solutions, and then I will speak about <coughs> bounds, and then this will be the main part of today's talk. Uh, uh, Reed Solomon like construction of codes with locality. And then there are some other things, and then along, along the way I'll mention some open problems. So, state of the art. Mm. It goes under this acronym RAID, uh, which started as redundant array of inexpensive disks, but then gradually morphed into independent disks. Uh, RAID 1 was the obvious solution, replication. So they, they took every, every node and row, made two, two other copies of it. So altogether, three, uh, every piece of data is replicated three times in the system. Now, as coding theorists, we know that cannot be optimal. But in fact, it's not such a bad solution for these systems. Mm. The data is highly available. If a drive is failed, then we simply read down another drive. And the amount of the data we need to read is exactly the amount of the failed data, inaccessible data. So this is very, very nice for that application. Any two disk failures can be tolerated. And so this is widely used in, in Hadoop and systems that run around Hadoop, such as Facebook, such as Yahoo, Microsoft Azure, and so on. Uh, and the most of, of data centers really uh, run this RAID 1 system, the three times replication. Of course, the big problem is the 200% overhead. And at the scale of petabytes, or hundreds of petabytes, or maybe even thousands, that is, there is a price to pay for that. So that is a real cost for those companies. So they started to look for different solutions. And again, you turn to any coding theorist, and what do they say? They say, oh, we know erasers. We need to use red solvent codes. Yes. So. It went through RAID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those were variations of replication. Then came to RAID 6, which is, uses a simple red solvent code of length 6. Um, so in general, a red solvent code length n, dimension k, uh, can tolerate any n minus k disk failures. So this is the number of message symbols. This is the block length. So if we spread the block across multiple drives, then we can recover from any n minus k disk failures. But there is a problem about red solvent codes, namely the, the repair problem, the single disk failure. In that scenario, red solvent codes are far from optimal. So let's see why. 1410, 10 uh, symbols of data over the field of 16 elements are encoded into 14. So we are adding four parity checks. And let's say one drive is failed, so this symbol is inaccessible. So what do we need to do to repair? Well, we need to read off 10 symbols. So reading 10 symbols creates traffic in the network. And on the scale of the events in those networks, the system becomes inoperable. It's dysfunctional. The, the communication channels are clogged. So in fact, this is not a good solution, as it turns out. And if you look at what they do, as they say, they raid the data, move it to read solvent codes from replication. So what's the percentage of the data that they were able to raid? In fact, it's less than 10%. It's 6 to 8%, depending on where you read about that. And then they started to try to do more, and then they realized they couldn't do that. So read solvent codes are not, not optimal in this application. So, uh, and, and we shall see. We shall try to do something else about that. There are other solutions. They are somewhat ad hoc. They don't carry much of a theory, but in fact, they work better than Red Solomon codes. This is one of the first proposals from Microsoft. Uh, every six symbols are, are, they are, there are parity checks attached to them as follows. There is one for the first three, one for the second three, and then there are two global parity checks uh, for the six symbols. If one drive is failed here, then we can use this parity to recover. Same here, and then for a failure of two within the same set of three, we use global parities. 
not a bad solution, really. And, and later they went on to develop similar constructions, and this 1410 is what is actually installed, from what I understand, in the Azure system. Uh, so again, there are two, two groups of five, one parity check for the first five, one parity for the second five, two global parity checks. Uh, this is again from the same group, from one, and then there are uh, people from, from this community, Prakshit Gopalan, Sergei Yehanin, they are all a part of, of this line of work. And it all started with the paper on pyramid codes in 2007, which was one of the first to mention locality. Uh, right. So with that, let us move to define locally recoverable codes. What do we want? And then we shall discuss the constructions. So let us say we have a, a block code over a finite field, length n, and then r is locality. So let, let us write all the code words. Every row in this table is a code word in the code. Uh, isolate a coordinate. Call it little i, this coordinate. Let us say these are all the symbols in that coordinate. There is a bunch of code words that have symbol A, A prime, and so on. Uh, we assume that there is a subset of coordinates, of R coordinates, denoted I here, a recovering set of this coordinate little i, such that if we read a part of the encoding within this capital I coordinates, we can uniquely recover the value in this coordinate i. Well, for that, we need, obviously, that as we restrict the code to the I coordinates, rest restrict, so project it on these coordinates, all the rows that we see that correspond to the value A are disjoint from the rows that we see that correspond to the value A prime. And that for every pair of symbols. If that happens, then we can recover the value of A uniquely by accessing these R coordinates. That is the, the idea behind the definition, and of course it is easy to formalize this as is done here. First, we restrict the code to a subset of coordinate j. This is a projection, projection on, on the subset j. And then we isolate this subblock that corresponds to a particular symbol a. Cjai, so there are all the, all the projections on j such that in the ith coordinate they have value a. Uh, the code has locality R if those subsets for different A symbols in the i coordinate are disjoint, exactly as we said in the picture, and well, formally it reads as shown here. Um, so these are the, uh, some, some of the early works in this area. In fact, apart from the Microsoft, there was also a, a paper from IBM. Uh, in 2007, uh, discussing locality. Uh, one of the early works is again by Frédéric Augier. Uh, and then the Microsoft paper was really the one that put this locality on the map. It was you know, the, the last discoverer of America after that. This became firmly established in our community. And so it took off from there. Uh, and also they got some award for that paper last year. And what they did in that paper, one thing important was a bound on the parameters of those codes with locality. So we said that there is length, there is dimension, there is R locality, and then, of course, we can ask what's the minimum distance of those codes. And to even, before asking this question, why do we need the distance? As we said, well, mostly we need to correct one erasure, and so a lot of distances may, may not be needed, but then maybe there are more than one drive failures, maybe a cluster is taken out of maintenance, apparently. I spoke with Parikshit Gopalan, and he told me that Microsoft regularly does that, and in that situation we need to be able to handle more than one erasure, and therefore the distance becomes of importance. So. With that in mind, let us look at the following theorem. Let us say we have a code of length n. Uh, k is uh, log of the cardinality. Well, well, I'll deal with linear codes, but all of this applies to without linearity. Never mind. Let's say length n, dimension k, locality r, over some field, 
of size q, some alphabet. Uh, then the rate of the code, so the number of data symbols that are contained, the proportion of the of a data symbol contained in one encoding symbol k over n is at most r divided by r plus 1. Uh, and this should be clear, really, because as we said, one coordinate can be recovered from r coordinates. So given r, we get that one for free. So that one is not independent. Therefore, out of r plus 1, one coordinate is wasted. And so the rate cannot exceed r divided by r plus 1. Not an exact proof, but the idea pretty much gets it. And then the distance satisfies this bound. n minus k minus 1 r of k plus 2. Uh, Gopalan and co-authors proved that for linear codes, Dimitris Papelopoulos for unrestricted codes. And uh, two things to be, are to be said about this bound. First, any code has, can, be, can be thought of as code with locality k, because given k symbols in a linear code, we can re recover any other symbol. And so r equal to k is the largest possible. And what happens if we put r equal to k? Well, we get back the familiar singleton bound. n minus k minus 1 plus 2. So we get the singleton bound. Uh, it is interesting to see why this is true. Now, this happens as follows. The distance of the code can be expressed using the, this red formula up there on the slide. But if we look at, again, the table of all the code words, look at any pair of rows. So suppose they coincide in some subset of coordinates. Then, of course, the distance between them is n minus the cardinality of that subset. And if the, a pair of code words coincide, then the total number, if we restrict the code to this subset of coordinates s, the total number of distinct rows is strictly less than q, q to the k. We don't see all the possibilities. So then, if we go over all possibilities for the set s and take the largest, we get back this formula, the distance of the code, this is the maximum cardinality of a set where there are repetitions, and n minus that is the distance. The singleton bound, well, if there is no locality, then of course the max such s can, cannot be larger than k minus 1. And so we get n minus k plus 1. What happens if we have locality? And Let's call that bound the singleton bound, even though the, the bound with locality. Not exactly true, but it's similar set of ideas. So the singleton bound with locality works as follows. Let us take the coordinate i, coordinate i, and let i, subscript i, be of size r or less, be the recovering set for that coordinate. Now, take that many coordinates k minus 1 divided by r. And take the union of the recovering sets. It doesn't matter which coordinates, let us say from 1 to m. So jm is the union of the recovering sets. And by the choice of m, the cardinality of jm is at most k minus 1. Now, to that set jm, let us add the coordinates themselves, 1 through m. Those coordinates depend on the recovering sets. And so the cardinality of the code restricted to jm prime to this new set is still less or equal than q to the power of k minus 1. We don't have everything. It may be that jm prime is already a size k minus 1, maybe not. And if not, we just supplement it to k minus 1 by adding any coordinates. It does not matter. Let us say the resulting set is lm. The cardinality of the code restricted to Lm is less than the full cardinality. And so going back to that definition, 
we just need to compute the cardinality of Lm. So Lm plays the role of S here. Lm is k minus 1 plus m, which is k minus 1 plus this definition of m. And this is the same as the right-hand side, and that proves the bound. So it's slightly more involved than the singleton bound, because we need to take locality into account. But that's how we get it. Then there is another bound. Yes, yeah, so this has been established, and I will mention two more bounds. Uh, because the first question we ask ourselves is about the parameters, and once that has been cleared, we move to constructions. Constructions are more difficult than parameters. So the bound by Vivek Adamb and Arya Mazumdar is as follows. Let's say we have a linear code, NKR, so locality R. Let us put k optimal. k optimal of length distance is the max dimension of a code of length r. Length n distance d. Maximum dimension k optimal. So what we do, we really shorten the code. Consider the set Lm that we constructed here on the proof. And this Lm can be done for m, but it can be done for smaller numbers, s from 1 to m. And so we call them Ls here. Uh, s goes from 1 to m. Uh, the cardinality of the code restricted to Ls is at most q to the rs, as before. So if we shorten the code, on the coordinates in the set Ls, we get a code of length n minus s r plus 1, distance d. So the optimal dimension of that code is this. And then we have thrown out our s coordinates. And altogether, this bounds above the dimension of our code. Now, this is a somewhat naive shortening argument. But in fact, this is the best we know. And otherwise. You know, getting good bounds for, for codes with locality is very much an open problem. The sphere tacking bound is absent, the basic Hamming bound, uh, the other well-known upper bounds are absent. So that's the first open problem I wanted to mention. And what about the existence? Can we construct those codes? Can we claim something about those codes? Well, the gilbert warsham bound is the first thing that, that we think of when we think existence. And what is the GV bound? It is as follows. We say we want to construct a linear code. So um, let us say this is the parity matrix. We know that to have distance d, we need that every d minus 1 of fewer columns are linearly independent. So we start adding columns to the parity matrix. When can we add another column? Well, we can add another column when q to the n minus k is greater than all the possible linear combinations up to d minus 2. So if d minus 2 uh, linear combinations do not cover the entire space, we can add another linearly independent column, and every d minus 1 will still be linearly independent. And so as long as this happens, there exists a code of length n, dimension k, distance d. Without locality. Well, now we want locality. What do we do? Well, we run this you know, LDPC type argument. Let us add a little parity check for the first recovering set, r plus 1, the second, and so on. So we have added n, r plus 1 additional parities. And therefore, dimension goes down by that quantity. Let's call this k. Dimension goes down by that quantity. And therefore, this is the guaranteed dimension of the our code now with locality, because we have added parity checks. And this is the formula written here, hopefully. Uh, and 
well, the GV bound is often written in an asymptotic way. So from k, we go to k over n and denote it by r. From d, we go to the relative distance. And so we would have 1 minus the entropy of delta, but now we have r divided by r plus 1. So this is slightly inferior. And if you, you want to get rid of the entropy, then this is the explicit formula. So that's it for the bounds. And the main part of, of what I'm trying to explain is constructions. Let's move to constructions. Well, there were some early works. Uh, Vijay Kumar and his students constructed optimal, uh, let's call the codes optimal if they meet the singleton type bound on the distance. They constructed optimal codes, but the length was only this. So the, the not much flexibility about the parameters. Then there were two constructions by uh, the Texas and m group. Uh, no, Texas Austin. Or Austin. Huh? UT Austin, I'm sorry. UT Austin. Uh, and by Zach Tamo and, and Alex Demakis and Dimitris Papalopoulos, one of them uses Gabidulin codes mentioned earlier today. They are the linearized polynomials, and they're optimal, but they need large alphabet, as all constructions that involve Gabidulin codes. Now, in those data exchange problems, large fields are forced upon you, maybe. But here, large, large fields are, of course, a, a detriment, a shortcoming. We don't want constructions of the fields of size exponential in the, in the length of the code. Uh, they are optimal, but no system designer will look at them. So that's where we start. Uh, let us remind ourselves of Ritz-Solomon codes. And of course, they were mentioned many times. But you know, for someone who haven't seen them before, like I mean, for instance, <laughs> let, uh, let us let us <laughs> remind ourselves. Uh, it is a code of length uh, at most q minus one over a finite field of size q, and uh, we do the following: we need to encode k symbols into n symbols, and for that we we define or we will work with polynomials. Define the evaluation map. Suppose there is a subset of elements of the finite field f q, f one through p one through p n. Those are the points in the field. Given a polynomial, one variable over that same field, evaluation maps the polynomial to the vector of values of that polynomial at the points p one through p n. So then Ritz-Solomon code encodes k symbols. Uh, from a vector of k symbols, it takes, makes a polynomial with those coefficients. So the degree of that polynomial is k minus 1 or less. Uh, k minus 1 degree needs k coefficients. Then we evaluate that polynomial and get a Ritz-Solomon code word. The map is linear, so the code is linear. And we know the distance. We know everything about it. And to give an example, let's say, the alphabet is 8, and then the dimension is 3. Uh, we take three, three symbols, one alpha, alpha, where alpha is, let's say, the primitive element, a primitive element in the field. And then we make a polynomial, 1 plus alpha x alpha x squared, and then we evaluate it. And we can do that by hand, or we can use the computer. And this gives us the code word. In fact, let me see if I can use the computer. So there is this Sage cloud application of Sage, which runs distributed storage, I'm sure. And Sage, in fact, is a huge system that incorporates it's, it's, it's an alternative to all those com commercial pieces of software, Mathematica, Maple. And within Sage, you can run GAP. And if I have a connection, it will run. And if I don't, then you will believe me. But Gap is not a fashion store in the United States. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big system. It's called Groups, Algorithms, and Programming. And it does coding theory very well. You know, It knows everything about code. So you don't need to program it. You just tell it, I want this code, and it already knows it. Well, yes. It's taking a little while. Ah, the connection is slow, I'm sorry. And then there is a coding package in this gap, which is, has this funny name, Guava. Uh, 
and it tells you something. It's not very readable there on the bottom, right? But then you define the element in the in the in the finite field z two to the three three th that is fi finite notation for a primitive element in GFA, and then we tell it that we want x to be the indeterminate indeterminant GF eight. Huh? I. Damn it. <laughs> Where? Oh, the, D. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be entertaining, but it turns into... Ah. Where? I am. I am. I am. I am. Where? In the... Ay, ay, ay. Well, sorry, but never mind. Let, let us move back. No, don't laugh, I can do it. <laughs> it's just slower than I wanted it to be. But I did it yesterday and it worked. Uh, now, this is easy to do by hand, but the other thing that I want to do later is more difficult, and then this system is very, very efficient. So then, what did we do? We took a polynomial, this f of x, and then we evaluated it all, all the points of the field. And we get the code word. Let us say one coordinate is erased. What do we need to do? Well, we need to read off k symbols from elsewhere. I want to modify this construction so that we can incorporate the locality condition. The idea is this. Suppose instead of reading k symbols, we can interpolate a low degree polynomial through this point and a few other points. So through R points, and then we get back this point. Right? And uh, let's say through two points, and then we would need a straight line, of course, but for the purpose for the you know, artist's impression is this, this curve going through two points and giving this value. Let us say it is possible to interpolate a polynomial of degree two through every three cor through, through every three coordinates. So modifying the Ritz Solomon construction, perhaps we can get back locality so that we don't need to interpolate the entire polynomial, but we can get away with low degree polynomials. It is possible to do this, I'm going to explain this. But we need a specially chosen set of points. We cannot use any set of points. We need a restricted set of polynomials. And let me explain how this works. Let us consider this example. Let's say the length is 9, dimension 4, locality 2. So I should be able to recover a symbol by accessing just two symbols in the encoding, not four symbols. Let us take the following set of points. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, 7 is missing, 8 is missing, 11 is missing. Why? Well, we'll see later why. So my code will have length 9. Let us partition it into three subsets. And my goal will be, in the encoding, if uh, a code symbol in coordinate number 3 is erased, then I access 1 and 9, and I get it back by interpolating a linear polynomial. If 4 is erased, then I interpolate through the values at 12 and 10, and get back the value at 4. So the dimension is 4. And the message, therefore, contains four symbols. They have two subscripts for some reason that will be clear later. So for the moment, let's just look at these four symbols. And then we take the polynomial space. And again, we don't take the degree x square. We take degree 0, 1, 3, 4. And there are reasons for that that may become clear later. Uh, and then we just uh, evaluate those polynomials of this form at this set of points. And this is my new code. For instance, A is 1, 1, 1, 1. The polynomial is, therefore, 1 plus x, x cubed, x4, f of, f of x. Evaluate at these points. So let's evaluate at 1, and we get 4. Let's evaluate at, I, I'm using, I think I'm using this order. So let's try to evaluate at 3. 1 plus 3, 4 plus 27. Uh, 
one. Yes, 27 is one, and therefore this is five, plus 81 makes 86, and 78 is divisible by 13, so 86 mod uh, 13 is eight, and so we get eight, and so on. This is my code word. Where is the locality? Let's say the coordinate FA1 is erased. Then we need to access the recovering set for this coordinate 1, that is 3, 9. At 3 we get uh, 8, at 9 we get 7. So let's compute a polynomial that at 3 is 8, at 9 is 7, has degree 1, two linear equations, we get to x plus 2, and that 3 indeed is 8, and that 9 is 7. Let's try to evaluate delta at 1, and we get 4. <laughs> and this is true for every coordinate uh, out of any recovery set. So this is the idea. And let us look at why this is true in general. So the construction goes as follows. Our Q will be greater than N, but otherwise it will be of the order N. So we are moving down from exponentially sized alphabet to an alphabet of size comparable to the length, which is in line with the Ritz-Solomon code construction. So it seems to be a reasonable, reasonable construction to be used. Uh, let us assume for simplicity of presentation that R plus 1 divides N, as before uh, R plus 1 is 3 divides 9. And let us assume that R divides K. Uh, R was 2, K was 4. Both can be lifted, but the construction becomes a bit messier. Uh, oops. <laughs> I'm sorry. One doesn't expect to be called in Brazil. <laughs> but things happen. Let me just disconnect it. Right. So we have these two assumptions. Let us take a set of points in the field of size n. Here is the main ingredient of the construction. Suppose there is a polynomial g of degree r plus 1 uh, such that there exists a partition of this set into subsets of size r plus 1 such that g is constant on every subset. As in the example, we had G. It wasn't prominent here, so I'm giving another example. Yes. X3, X cubed, is constant on all the subsets in our partition. And this is, in general, what we are requiring. So let's say at 1, and G of 1 is, is 1. At 3, uh, 27 mod 13 is 1. At 9, it is also 1. Uh, and it is also constant on a2 x cube, and it is constant on a3. Suppose there is such a polynomial. So with that polynomial, we do the following encoding. Partition our set of points, a, into subsets of, of size r plus 1. And then to encode the message, we take k symbols and we write them as aij, where i it takes r values, j takes k over r values, so altogether are k symbols, but they're partitioned into those groups. Construct the polynomials fi of x from j to k over r minus 1, aij, so this is sum on j, gx to the j. Right, j, so here it gets somewhat non-trivial, gx to the j. And then we take a make out of these polynomials, we make a polynomial as follows. Fa for the message, sum fi of x, x to the i. So we take j x to the j, x to the i. And then the encoding goes as in Ritz-Solomon coding. We take our polynomial fa, we have evaluated at all the points of the set a, we get the code. And I should jump ahead, I should say that, that so this, this, by the way, comes from the work with, with Zach Tamil. And it, it has been bothering me for about a year. 
what does this really mean? I mean, is there another break meaning of, of this of this representation? And yes, there is. Maybe we'll get to that later. But for the moment, please accept it. So how do we recover the array symbol? Well, as we said, we interpolate a low degree polynomial. We take the recovering set AJ uh, for a, a lost symbol, find the polynomial that goes through all the points of the set AJ except the lost point, the failed drive. The degree, therefore, so there are R plus 1 points in total, 1 is erased, there are R points left, so the degree is R minus 1. And explicitly, if we want to write it, there is this Lagrange interpolation, so we get, we get the, the expression. Is the recovering set unique? The recovering set, the picture that I'm having in mind is as follows. Yes, it is unique in, by the construction. The picture that I'm having in mind is as follows. If this symbol is erased, we access the, the symbols in the preset recovering set. So for every symbol, we know what its recovering set is. But of course, I mean, there are distinct recovering sets because they, they are small and the block length is larger. And then the claim is that as we take this delta, delta evaluated at the point alpha, we get the lost chord. The main claim about this construction is as follows. The, code are, the codes are singleton optimal, uh, length n dimension k locality r. So this seems to be a, a reasonable extension of read solvent codes. Optimality is easy because uh, the, the encoding polynomials, uh, the, there is a basis of different degrees, so we count the dimension of the this, of this space of polynomials, the mapping is linear, so, and the distance is computed by counting degrees because <coughs> the polynomial cannot have too many zeros. So optimality is proved by counting. Slightly more interesting is locality. So let alpha be the erased location. So alpha is the point at which the drive had failed. Well, define the polynomial d of x, sum fi alpha xi. Well, by the construction, this fi alpha is constant on the entire recovering set. And therefore, the, this polynomial d for every point in the recovering set is the same as the encoding polynomial. Very well, but at the same time, the degree of this polynomial d is less than r, r minus 1 or less. But we already had this delta that was interpolated through these points, and that also that took the same values and had the same degree. And so they must be equal. And therefore, delta indeed does the trick. It calculates the lost point. This more or less proves this theorem. If you spend a little more time, you'll convince yourself that this works. Well, all of this is shining, but, but what about G? Do such polynomials, yes? Just a question. Are there any further restrictions on the rate, or does this work for all rates? Uh, this pretty much works for all rates. So the rate is R over R plus 1 by design. There is this divisibility thing, but it, can't, it could be gotten rid of. It's a very strong condition, it's a very restricting one. But this is needed for optimality. Yeah, if you have uh, just a covering, it's maybe the intersection will still be able, uh, not the optimal rate, but will still be able to recover locally. Yes, this is possible. This is possible, but apparently this is not needed because it just works like that. So this you know, overlapping recovering sets is something that had not been explored in this problem. And this is one question that could be analyzed because maybe we have more flexibility with the parameters. So that's, that's very, very true. Very good. How to find G? Claim, take a subgroup of the multiplicative group of FQ or of the additive group. Take the annihilator of that subgroup. So what's the annihilator is the polynomial of degree equal to the cardinality of H that takes the value zero at every uh, point of the subgroup. It is constant on each coset. 
of, G, of H, including H itself, of course. So that is, that, that is one way to get the partition. Indeed, let us say H is a multiplicative subgroup and let A and A H bar be two elements in the call set where H bar is from the group, from the subgroup. Well, I'm claiming that G of A, G of A equals G of A H bar. Obvious, right? G A H is the product. A H bar minus H, take out H bar. Uh, we get H bar to the power H, but that's the size of the group, so the, that is one. A minus H, H bar minus one. But this runs over the entire group. As H runs over H, this disappears, so we get back G of A. So G of A is indeed the needed polynomial. So that, that's how I constructed it in the example. I took a subgroup of, so F13 multiplicative group has size cardinality 12, and there is a subgroup generated by, by cube root of unity, and that's what I did. Well, there are some generalizations. Mm. I'm a bit hesitant if I should go over them, because it becomes slightly messier. We need more notation. We speak of the algebra of polynomials. Let me fly over this, because I don't have I don't have nice examples in this part. And this takes how many? This takes perhaps just one slide. So we have the locator set. We have a partition of that locator set. Let's let's in general say consider the algebra of polynomials such that f is constant on every set in the partition. Uh, the dimension of the algebra equals the number of elements in the partition, and there is a way to choose a basis in the algebra. And having chosen the basis, we can construct our code using pretty much the same construction. Mm. So this is a general description. This is not to say that this adds to, to actual ways of constructing the codes, but if you want to know how to phrase this more generally, then we should use this language of, of polynomial algebras. And so then the encoding will be a mapping from uh, uh, the, this uh, algebra of polynomials times x to the i direct some of those algebras. The mapping to, to the evaluation mapping creates a code with locality. That's it. And there are some extensions of this construction. As I said, it is possible to lift the divisibility constraints. And it becomes slightly messier because this last tail where it is not divisible, then we need to do something by hand. Then we need to really you know, squeeze it into place. But it is possible. It is possible to encode systematically because that's what system designers want. Nobody wants to, to change, change the entire encoding if the data was changed. Right? But systematic encoding is possible algebraically. Of course, I mean, any linear code has systematic encoding. That's not a question. But here it is possible to do it algebraically. So the, there is an easy modification of this construction. Within every recovering set, we had a single parity check, right? So this is a trivial MDS code uh, uh, with distance two. Having, having you know, this general picture of coding in mind, why wouldn't we use some other MDS code within this recovering set? Why? Well, we then we can correct for more erasures. And this can be done, and there is a bound, in fact, for, for uh, which is, again, an extension of the singleton bound. And if you believe that one, then this is kind of believable. Uh, rho minus 1 is the, the distance of this MDS code. Uh, from 2013. And then we can modify our construction, taking a different polynomial basis. We can construct codes that pretty much the same the same uh, approach that uh, fit this, match this bound meet this bound with equality. Mm. So yes, it is possible to do that. Let's take this out of the way. Now the next problem is the availability problem. So as we said, there is a recovering set. It's okay. 
I mean, change the battery yesterday, it still didn't work. <laughs> So yes, I was speaking of recovering sets. We have this erased symbol and there is its recovering set. But let us say there are many users that want to access that symbol, that, that date. It's called hot data. So then they try to access the same recovering set. And they cannot because the capacity of the channel is leading there. They cannot read it off at the same time. What if there is another recovering set? orthogonal to it, within the same encoding, that can be accessed simultaneously and give the same value. Well, then it increases availability, right? And there is a very concrete example of this. When many, 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 many users want to access some information, such as this one, <laughs> you know, some vaguely familiar faces. And in fact, when they did it, Twitter crashed because the users couldn't access it. What can we do about this? Well, let us say that every symbol in the encoding appears in several disjoint recovering sets, orthogonal. Right? So we use this term orthogonal. In fact, this orthogonal had been used earlier in coding theory when they did uh, majority logic decoding of Red Muller codes. And that was in the 1950s, yes. Uh, so let us say every symbol i is recoverable from two sets, several recovering sets. The code has two disjoint recovering sets if for every i as there are two sets ri1, ri2, such that uh, on r1, the restriction to r1 identifies the value at i uniquely. So a is different from a prime. And the, the restriction to r2 does the same independently. And then you can extend this to t recovering sets if you want. So what's the idea? Can we construct it? Yes. Uh, let's do this. Let us try our Reed Solomon codes. Again, this is the Reed Solomon code word. Then let us say this is erased. Let us say this is the first interpolation. But let us say that simultaneously we can interpolate another polynomial through a different set of points and still recover the value gamma or the value at gamma at the point gamma. So fa of gamma can be found by interpolating delta 1 as well as delta 2. So that's the idea. How do we do this? Let's go back to F13. Let us take two subgroups now, uh, generated by 5 and generated by 3. Uh, and 5 gives us this partition, so it's a fifth degree root of unity, and this is a cube root of unity. And uh, these partitions are orthogonal, because you look at every two blocks, they intersect on one point. And in general, it is possible that they are completely disjoint, and then they don't have a point that they recover, or they intersect on only on one point, but never on two points. So consider the set of polynomials that are constant on each block of the partition. And the basis of this algebra, F, F A G, uh, for the group G is 1x4x8. And the basis of this algebra for A H is this set of polynomials. So altogether, we have to algebras and of course we take the direct sum and take our basis of the code from that, that, that direct sum. Let's look at the example. Let's construct a code of length 12, dimension 4, two recovering sets for every symbol. One from two symbols, the other from three symbols. Uh, looking back at that picture, we can recover this point from two symbols and we can recover it from three symbols. And this is what we need to get back. This is what I want to do. The notation is LRC, length, dimension, and then two recovering sets, size two, size three, and the distance will be six. Uh, and so we take symbols of F13, four symbols map to 12 symbols in F13. Take four symbols, make a polynomial of this form, a0, we have an x, a2, x4, a3, x6. Uh, it can be written in two ways using these two sets of polynomials, FAG and FAH. The first way is this. So there are three polynomials, F0, F1, F2. 
they play the role of our FIs from the previous construction. And it can be written in this form. Uh, where are, there are two Gs, G0 and G1. Uh, and then we have this FA, the same polynomial, this polynomial written in this way. And that accounts for two different ways of interpolating. So the coordinate at 1 can be interpolated by computing delta 1 at the points 5, 12, 8. And at the same time, it can be computed by interpolating delta 2 through 3 and 9. So we get two different orthogonal parity checks. And by two interpolations, we can get simultaneously the value of, of delta 1 by accessing 2 and by accessing 3. So that enhances availability properly. So what about the optimality of this construction? Well, this becomes trickier. When the distance is 6, this again gotten by counting degrees. Uh, why is it 6 indeed? Well, because the largest degree is 6, so it can have 6 or fewer zeros, and so 12 minus 6 gives us distance 6. And maybe it's more, but I, don't, I think it's, in this example it's exactly 6. There is a general construction. Well, the general construction just says the same thing, but in a fancy language of, of polynomial algebras. There is a theorem that, that says what I just said in this example in general terms. Never mind that. Sasha, yes? You get those partitions, you are starting the number properties, actually. Yes, indeed. Let's look at that. So orthogonal partitions can be obtained by using the additive group of the field or the multiplicative group of the field, subgroups of the field. Let's say the multiplicative subgroups, they have to sub, and we, we already had that. G and H in F13 star, so 12 elements, and we have two orthogonal partitions. Let us take the additive group, F13 plus, or F16. Uh, F13 is not interesting. Let's say take, take F16 in that respect. Let's take uh, F16. So F16 is Z2 squared cross Z2 squared, right? There are two copies of Z2 squared. Let us take two subgroups, G and H, each of them being Z2 squared. So this is G. I'm now switching to the vector notation. And uh, so we have uh, Z2 square in the last two coordinates. And for H, we have Z2 square in the first two coordinates. And then we get the first partition from G, as shown here. 16 elements now. We take all the elements. 0 is a part of it. It's the additive group. And we get the second partition. Let's take this block and this block. They intersect on alpha 5, but that is joint otherwise. Let's take this and this, they intersect on alpha 9. Take this and the first, they intersect on alpha 4, and so on. So that's how we do it. Proposition. Two subgroups generate orthogonal partitions, coset partitions, right? If and only if, and only if, I don't know about only if, never mind only if, <laughs> if they intersect by identity. All right, so this is sufficient. So take, take two subgroups that don't intersect non-trivially, that gives you orthogonal partitions, so you can do availability. Well, some, some remarks in the end. There are other ways of constructing codes with multiple recovering sets, such as, let's say, product codes. If we take a product code construction, and the column gives one recovering set, the row gives another one. Slightly more obvious, right? Bipartite graph code, which is a variation of the product code construction. Uh, they don't compete in the way of the in terms of the parameters, but if for some reason you are interested in asymptotics, this may be a good way to look at them, at those codes with multiple recovering sets. So all of this, what I was presenting, comes from the work with Zach Tamo of last year. And I have a silly picture of Zach with myself. Well, silly is only myself. He looks OK. Let me see if I can find it. I thought I could, but not anymore. No. Well, we had this very, very nice two years of collaboration, when he, which he spent at Maryland. 
นะเนื้อมันสุดที่ฮีร์โอ้ยสันโอเวอร์ดิสสุดที่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่นี่ This is, you know, a school on coding theory. So, a school we look in textbook. So, what do we, what can we do about Red Solomon codes? We can do two things, right? They generalize in two ways. The first way uh, we can do cyclic codes, BCH type codes. What about binary codes with locality? Do they exist? That is a question to be analyzed. And then there is another way. So, as we said, we evaluate those. Polynomials at the points of the finite field, think of it as of the affine line, and we can replace the line with a curve, of course, algebraic curve, and then we get some other codes. And interestingly, if we look at curves, that is exactly where this algebraic na nature pops up. So it really took, took took us about a year to figure out that that is the right way to look at that, that construction. Uh, I don't know if I should start it now. Oh yes, yes. Before going there, here are bounds on the parameters of codes with multiple recovering sets. So T recovering sets uh, <coughs> proves become difficult, and disappointingly, these results are very likely not final because those multiple recovering sets they start to interact with each other in a non-obvious way. And so you do some counting on a graph, for instance, but at some point you need to, you need to, to give something away. And as you are giving it away, you are probably losing in the tightness of the bounds. So for the rate, we have this. And if you substitute t equal 1, we get this, this clear formula, r divided by r plus 1. But for t, we get this rather messy expression. And even to understand what this is, it's not quite immediate, but well, it is t to the 1 over r root of t. That is the upper bound on the rate, and for the distance we have this, and then there is another bound, and these bounds are in general locations. So sometimes one is better, sometimes another is better, and uh, some of the examples that are constructed meet these bounds, but most don't. So it's not clear where it is. So this is this is rather open. This other work is by Kit Rawat from, from, again, Austin, Texas Austin. And then, as we said, it can be extended in two ways. Algebraic curves and subfield subcodes. Subfield subcodes means BCH codes, binary codes. I would really like to stop here because it's a very logical point. That's actually where you start. Next time, huh? Thursday. All right. Let me show you something. What is your favorite curve? Permission. Well, since you asked for it. <laughs> This was not set up. <laughs> Right, Hermitian curve. You see, you know, that's where this connection would really help, but I don't, I don't have it. So then, you know, it takes you a while to define Hermitian curve. But at the end of the day, what you need, so previously what we had was this straight line. And straight line more or less, well, the affine part of the Do you really write the equation of the straight line? X equals to what? Huh? You can do it probably in, uh, uh, with uh, projected points. Yes, and how do you do that? <laughs> you can uh, write y equal to some polynomial of x. No, no polynomial, no, no, no. 
Well, actually, you, you don't write the equation. Actually, you have to write one column T union zero T. You don't need an equation. Yes, but I would like an equation. But never mind. So all the points of the field, they represent, uh, uh, can be thought of as the affine line. We can add the point at infinity, become the projective line. And then from there, we can replace it with, with a curve such as this one. Uh, consider all set of, set, the set of pairs in F9 that satisfy the equation x cubed plus x equals y4. Why that equation? Well, there are reasons for that. And the, the set of curves is called the Hermitian curves. Uh, this curve has 27 points. You know, it all, start, it all goes as follows. Uh, the, there is a q0, and then there is q, which is q square, and then there is the curve is, uh, uh, well, we can consider it over fq, and then it has q0 cube, affine points, plus one point at infinity. And so q0 in my example is 3, and uh, uh, q is 9, and therefore, it has 27 points. And you can ask the computer what is the, pair, the set of pairs that fit this equation in F9. And this is the set of points. And uh, uh, so alpha is a primitive element in F9. Alpha square equals alpha plus 1. And then over every point of y, we see three points over every point. Well, not every. Most points of x, we see four points. And then there are some three points over which we see nothing. And you know, the word for it is that they, they, they're called totally ramified. And so over them, there is nothing in the extension. Uh, and what happens, really, we can construct codes with locality. And it turns out that these curves are really tailor-made for this construction with locality because of this structure. And this structure, in fact, persists. If you look at many families of curves, uh, you have naturally have this locality condition. And moreover, we have this locality in two directions. And this kind of tells you, well, you could ask for two recovering sets. And in fact, you can. Uh, so how do we do this? Recall again Red Solomon codes. We have a mapping from a set of functions spun by 1x, xk minus 1. And then that mapping takes us to fqn. What do we do in this case? Well, we take the space of functions of this form. Why is this form? Not quite immediate. But, well, I could perhaps say that, well, it's too early. So there are 27 points. The dimension is the number of functions, independent functions to the base is 6. So we take f, map it to f27 uh, over the field f9. Let's say the message is this. So then we have our encoding polynomial in this form. 1 plus alpha y, alpha square y square, alpha cube x, alpha 4 x y, alpha 5 x y square. And then we simply evaluate it at the point shown in this picture. Let's say evaluate at 0, 0, and then everything disappears and we get 1. And then you ask, you know, gap, and it tells you the remaining code word. So this is the code word, this 27 coordinates. Uh, there, are no, there is no linear order, right? They are ordered in two dimensions. The, the coordinates are ordered in two dimensions. And let us say this is the erased location. So that the coordinates of the location are alpha 1. And we want to recover it. And the magic is that we can still recover it by univariate polynomial interpolation. So the recovering set for uh, this erased point is uh, these two points, alpha 4, 1, alpha 3, 1. This is the recovering set for the point P. Let us find f of x such that f of alpha 4 is alpha 7, f of alpha 3 is alpha 3. And what about y? Well, on, along the y coordinate, it's a constant, so we really don't need that variable. So doing the calculation, we get f of x, alpha x minus alpha square. Let's see, substitute alpha 4. Alpha 5 minus alpha square, well, it has to be alpha 7. Uh, 
right? And then let's compute f of alpha. Well, f of alpha is 0. But this is what our lost coordinate had been. So, and th this happens for the entire picture. So that is codes on, with locality on permission curves. Uh, yes, and we want two recovering sets. But these points mess the picture up. And so let's throw them away, discard them. Now can, let's get the code of 924. And then uh, for this green point, alpha 5, alpha 3, we have two recovering sets, the blue points and the, the purple magenta points. The polynomial basis is, is given here, and we get a code of length 24, dimension still 6, and uh, the recovering sets of size 2 and 3. And, well, this is, this is the starting point. I mean, the, the, this part is not completely finished for multiple recovering sets. Yes? So what is, I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure. What is the, uh, the advantage of going to um, AG codes rather than read models? Uh, read Muller, read Muller. So, so you go to two dimensions and then each dimension independently have a, a lower degree uh, uh, result. Not read Solomon, though. Read Solomon? Yeah, it's not read Solomon. You, you take the entire set. In other words, you take all the, all the pairs, and on every row and every column you have uh, evaluations of. Uh, yes, univariate, right? So the. the or in Muller, you need many variables because this is this is what the, the this is two, just two variables. Two variables. Then you could go to no, but with two variables, you don't get too far, right? You can you only get that. You don't have flexibility in your parameters. You only get your second order at Muller code. Your parameters are fixed, right. and here you have all the flexibility. Or by taking some other some by take, other curve. and you can go to asymptotics. Okay. And since you are asking for it, right? right well, what we can do? Let me jump ahead. Take take this right, step, so that is the, and you get everything. So essentially what you do also in normal video. Yes. But this would be too fast. So yeah, I think this is this somewhat better than remote codes. Right? Let me indeed stop here and then next time I'll speak of that, I'll speak of cyclic code and, and maybe of some other things. Thank you. Thank you.